challenge. So I'm gonna jump right in, um, if that's okay. We have a lot to cover tonight. Um, so first of all, thanks for joining tonight. Um, so I am, who I am is, um, while Chanda works for Boulder County, I don't work for Boulder County. I'm a regular person just like you. My full-time job is that I'm a parish administrator at a church here in Boulder, but I have been, as we said, teaching compost education for Boulder County for 23 plus years. What we're gonna talk about tonight is based upon my real world experience of what it really means to compost, um, the lessons learned, what works, what doesn't work, what works in Colorado. I will tell you that for some of you who are in more, South Carolina is different, Minnesota is different, but 95% of what we're gonna talk about is gonna apply. I'm also gonna tell you what not to worry about on the internet, what isn't, doesn't apply, what might work in other parts of the country, but doesn't work here. So I'll just wanted to kind of give you that heads up. That's what we're going to do. And I, I'm sure if you've composted before, you'll learn something new, or if you've never composted, um, you will, the goal of tonight is that you would be able to get started from scratch. Um, you'll have all the tools you need to do that. So I'm going to jump right in. So, and tonight what we're talking about is basics of backyard composting. So I'm just going to ask the question, like, what is composting? What is this like magical thing we're trying to make happen? And what it actually is, is decomposing organic material. This is no different than when you go for a hike and you're carrying an apple with you and you eat that apple and you've got a core left over and you throw it off into the woods and it breaks down. It's exactly what we're talking about. We're just doing it in our backyards in a controlled way. So we get the end product, the compost. Now, when I say the word organic, I don't mean like the grocery store version of organic. I mean like the real definition, which is really means came from a living or once living thing. It doesn't matter if this is you shop in the organic section or not. That's not what this is about. But that's a question you should ask yourself before you put anything into your compost pile. Did this come from a living or once living thing? Really obvious when you're throwing in a banana peel. Less obvious when you're putting in something like a Kleenex. So you got to think about that that came from paper, which came from a tree, which came from a living or once living thing. So just to be aware of that, that's really what you should ask yourself before you put anything in your pile. What we're ultimately trying to make is compost. Now, let me just show you a picture of what finished compost looks like. I'm going to screen share that so you can all see that. So that's what finished compost looks like. It is dark, rich, crumbly. It looks like really awesome looking soil. But I need to clarify for you a couple of things about that. First of all, it is not soil. It's a soil amendment. It's something you mix in with the dirt, but it's not soil itself. It doesn't have the same structure as soil. Soil is really finely broken down. Rock has a lot more structure. So if you try to grow something in soil, it will actually have enough pressure to push against those roots to, to allow the plant to grow bigger and taller. Compost is a lot lighter, fluffier, um, but it is something you mix with soil, mix with dirt to make its contents better. So I just wanna mention that. And I also need to clarify, it's not fertilizer. Fertilizer is a quick release of nutrients for your plants, usually high in nitrogen. And compost is a slow release of nutrients. So don't think you're making dirt or soil. Sometimes you'll see words out there like that in the internet. And I'm just like, drives me crazy because you think that's what's happening. And it's really good stuff, don't get me wrong but you're not making soil, you're not making dirt. It does look a lot like it, but honestly, it looks better than most dirt in our backyards, uh, you know, unless you're buying brand new fresh topsoil. Um, that's what it should almost look like. So why do we do this? It's a beautiful night, at least here in Boulder County um, and maybe where you are, and you could easily be working in your garden instead of on a computer screen with all of us. But why we do this, number one, if you don't know, if we put our organics, the stuff that would go in our compost pile into the landfill, what happens is it breaks down without oxygen because landfills are designed to keep air and water out. And that's exactly two of the critical elements we need to make compost work. So things break down without oxygen, it's called anaerobically. But what really happens is, is that produces methane gas. So the more we send organic materials to the landfill, the more we're contributing to greenhouse gas production. Number one reason we don't want to be doing this. We clearly know that's a problem. Second, it's great stuff. We want to mix it into our soils because 
at least here in Colorado, we have terrible clay soils. So if you're a gardener or you try to grow in flowers, it's really tough to do in, this, in the ground we just have. But by mixing that compost in, it actually allows the plants to grow deeper roots to get to more nutrients and more water and that plant to get bigger above the soil and improves the uh, soil's ability to hold moisture really critical in most of our dry climates here in Colorado um, and in Southwest especially, but just it really helps the soil health here in Colorado. Um, but the other thing is, is part of the reason you guys are still important to know how to do this um, in Boulder County, if where we live, they just greatly reduce the amount of stuff that they'll take for compost collection services. So first of all, compost collection services are great. They can handle things your backyard pile can't but we can't put as much into them as we used to here because there was a lot of contamination and a lot of problems. So we're kind of getting that stream cleaned up. But even if we could do everything that way, there, that still requires trucks on the road that burn fossil fuels to haul that stuff where somebody composts it. And then you got to get that compost back to your garden. You doing it at home is still the most efficient, cost-effective way to do this. So Lots of good reasons why it's important to do your own backyard composting. Now I'll warn you, I'm a serious gardener. I grow like 53 tomato plants a year, but I don't even begin to make enough compost for my garden. I'm still buying some, but as much as I can make is as much as I can have space for. And it's as much of my kitchen scraps that I can divert and my yard waste that I can reuse on my own dirt, and my own plot of land, basically. So doing it in your backyard is still the best way to do it if you can do it. So I highly encourage you all to do it. And thanks for showing up tonight to learn more. So, all right, let's get really down to how you make this happen. So um, let's ask this question first. Um, think out, I'm just gonna name it because it's hard to sometimes do questions when we're doing this virtually. One of the things I like to comment on is that to be a living thing in Colorado, you need four basic elements. You need air, water, food, and shelter. You need to think of your compost pile as a living, breathing thing that needs those same things. Again, that's air, water, food, and shelter. The reason is, is because your compost pile should be full of all kinds of living, breathing things. So I am pulling up the first page of your handouts. These are the ones that we were talking about and you, um, if you grab that email from Chandra, this is what you have. And if not, you can look at it later. So you can just follow along because we're going to go through each of these about what's in them. But the first thing I want you to look at is this is the critters who do the work of the actual composting. How this actually work is we feed them th this image here at the top, this organic residue, and that is what they eat. And then they poop. That's really what compost is. It is these guys poop. So th they poop. And the guys, when this, is, when this is put into your compost pile, it attracts this first level guys, the snails, this bacteria, the worms, the fungus. And they eat some of this organic residue and they poop. And then this second level guys come because the first level guys were there. They're attracted to these lower level guys and some of the organic residue, they eat them both and they poop. And then the last guys come, the centipedes, the scorpions, the beetles, the ants, they eat some of the lower level guys, they eat the organic residue and they poop. These are the guys who do all the work of your compost pile. So our whole job in life is to make these guys happy. They live naturally in the top three inches of the soil. You do not need to add them to your pile. But this is like the field of dreams idea. If you build it right, they will come. That's our whole goal is to basically build it correctly so that they've got the air, the water, the um, shelter and the food that they need to live and thrive and eat and poop and eat and poop over and over again in your compost pile. So that's our whole goal for tonight. Now, the next page in your handouts, I'm just gonna hit some highlights here. At the top is some why. We talked about some of those. You can go through that later. But the next part of that second page, this is the second page of your handouts. There are five essential habits for a successful compost pile. If you get nothing else out of tonight, pay attention to these things. I will highlight them every time we talk about them, 
but I just wanted to point it out on page two, you have those already, okay? So we are gonna talk about food first. This is what you're gonna feed your compost pile. Um, it is sometimes food, sometimes it's other things. So what I wanna show, you should be able to hopefully see is what are greens and browns or browns and greens. So first thing you need to know is all the food you feed your compost critters who are doing the work in your feeding your pile, we put into two categories. We call them browns and greens. So let's talk first about the browns and what they are, and then we'll talk about some of the ratios between them. Okay, so first thing is the browns are sometimes known as carbon. They are more carbon-based, and this is gonna be predominantly your yard waste. Think things that are dry, woody, crunchy, will crackle when you touch them. They're usually dead longer. One of the best images of this is dried fallen leaves in the fall, okay? That is a brown. It'll tend to be things that have been dead longer. Maybe you cut it down and then it's just dried out. And what happens is it dried out, some of that nitrogen dissipates off into the atmosphere and it they will often be brown in color. That This also is the same thing as if you have like red or yellow fall leaves, but this is predominantly yard waste. And then look over here on the right, the greens. These are often food waste, not always and not always, but lush moist, more recently alive, will tend to be something that you just cut or just trimmed versus it sat around for a while and dried out. So think fresh cut grass, all the fruit and veggie scraps from your kitchen, stuff like that. Now I know there's some color variation in there, but they tend to be bright in color or green. And they will also have a lot of moisture content typically with them. So like lush, moist, it'll just feel less dry and crackly to the touch. Now back up here at the top, you need to see that at the top of this sheet, there's a couple very important things. So the first thing, and this is one of those critical things you have to get out of tonight to be a successful composter, is you ideally would wanna put a 50-50 mix of these two categories, a 50-50 mix of browns and greens into your bin by volume all the time. Now let's talk about that. First of all, I said by volume, not by weight. The greens are always gonna feel heavier. They have a higher moisture content. So they're just gonna feel denser, but that's okay. Do it by volume. Now, when I say volume, I'm talking you eyeball it. You're bringing out a wad of like kitchen scraps from your kitchen that looks about this size. You need to have a stash of browns so you can put in the equivalent size. So you keep that 50-50 ratio. Now, that's going to be a light, fluffy pile of leaves, and that's going to be a dense amount of food waste from your kitchen. But by volume, not by weight. Why do you do this? The greens is what attracts the critters, the guys who do the work, the fungus, the mold, the bacteria, the worms. The greens is what brings them to the pile. That's their candy, their sweet, but they can't live on that alone. They need a balanced diet with the browns as well. So you can't put just greens into your bin. It won't work. You have to have that 50-50 mix again by volume in your bin. And notice the next thing on here, one to two inch sized pieces. No matter which kind you're putting in, greens or browns, everything you put in must be this small, one to two inches in size. Yeah, I'm really talking this small. This is all about surface area. Remember some of the guys who come first? They were single-celled organisms, amoeba, fungus, molds. And so think about it. If you've got half of a watermelon that is in the leftover in your fridge and it gets kind of gross and slimy in your veggie drawer, and so you decide to pull it out, if you just take it and throw the whole thing into your bin, they can only attack so much of it. But if you've chopped it up into little one to two inch pieces, you've increased their surface area and then they can attack it so much faster. Particularly here in Colorado, that's especially important because we have wildlife. We don't wanna attract things to your pile and fresh food especially gives off the strongest odors, the green stuff, 
that will attract things to your pile. So we want to get your stuff past the fresh point as quickly as possible. So you cannot shirk on this when it comes to the greens. Things have to really be this small. So that means while you've got the cutting board out, chop everything up and then chop it up to that right size before you throw it into your little compost pail. Don't tell yourself you'll do it later as you put it into your bin because you won't do it, okay? So 50-50 mix by volume, one to two inches in size, okay? The other thing that isn't written on here, but I just wanna talk you through is that it's helpful if you give your critters a variety diet. By that, I mean, give them a whole bunch of different kinds of greens. Like see all the different greens listed on there. There's a whole bunch of options. As long as you're, you try not to give them too much of any one thing, just like carrots are good for me, but if all I ate was carrots, I would not feel so good. Same is true for your compost critters. So try to give them a variety diet as much as you can. And it's ideal to give them a variety diet of the browns as well too, but notice the top one here. It is okay if all your browns come from dried leaves. That's the one exception you can make. And that's because leaves are usually abundant certain times of the year, free, and they're generally one to two inches in size. Now I know a leaf can be a little bit bigger, but they're pretty thin. They break down pretty quickly. So think about that. They work good enough. You don't need to chop up leaves more than their standard size already. You know, they kind of curl as they as they um, dry and stuff like that. So it is okay the size it is. And it's great because you get a lot of them. So one of the first things you need to know, if you don't have it now, this fall, save your leaves. Because think about it. Think about what's all on that green list. Those greens are food waste mostly. A lot of it we generate year round. But when do we find browns? Twigs and sticks you might find during the year, but brown garden waste, it's the end of the season, fallen leaves. Most of this you find in the fall. So this fall, save a couple bags of leaves. We'll talk a little bit more about that, but I just want to point that out. Save some browns. So you've got literally a stash of browns right next to your compost bin. So every time you go out with that little pot of greens, you put it in an equal amount of browns. All right. There's a lot uh, we want to go through with these, so I'm going to keep us going. So let's talk about each of these categories. Um, I mean, each of the items in here. That'll answer a lot of the questions that often people have about food. And then we'll talk about what not to compost in your backyard pile, because that's as important as what to put in. And also what can still be done commercially here in Boulder County. So the first thing I want to point out to you is the dried fallen leaves. I am talking deciduous tree leaves. Um, I am talking the normal, it does not matter what kind of tree it is. Um, I don't care if it's an ash. And in Colorado, we have the ash borer. A lot of people are concerned about that. That's a bug that's killing um, our ash trees. Does not matter. My tree, my primary deciduous tree in my backyard is an ash tree. And that's what I'm using. I am treating that tree, trying to save its life, but I am having a, a, a bee safe arborist doing that so that they are doing um the there's a certain couple certain ones you can use that are better but i don't worry about that i go ahead and throw those in but i am it does not matter also the internet will say things like cottonwood leaves because first of all they're gigantic they're kind of rubbery people will say not to put those in your pile not true you can use whatever you've got for deciduous tree leaves also dried grass clippings. Now here I'm going to point out something. If you look at your list, look at the dried grass clippings are over under the brown, but look at the right side where the greens are and it says fresh green grass clippings there. What you count something is where it is when you put it into your bin, but you need to know everything starts as a green and everything ultimately will end as a brown. So fresh green grass clippings, your grass is getting tall, you mow it, it's green. It would be a green if you put those in right away. But if you let them lay on the lawn for two weeks and they kind of dried out into this brown thatch and then you raked it up and put it in your bin, now it's a brown and it's dried grass clippings. What happened? The nitrogen in that grass dissipated off into the atmosphere and it became more carbon oriented, which is why we would now count it as a brown. 
So you need to know, count it by when it is you're putting it in um, and stuff. But there, everything is a spectrum here and it only goes one way, green to browns. But once it's a brown, it's always a brown. That never changes. Doesn't matter if it gets wet and slimy and it feels a little moist because it got some moisture in it. That does not make it a green again. It is always a brown. So just realize that. Same with like leaves. If we have a spring snowstorm here after the leaves have budded out and you lose some green leaves from your tree, if you would put them in your compost pile, they count as a green. But if it's the dried fallen leaves in the fall, the brownish ones, then it would be a brown. So just realize that. So keeping going down the brown list here, we've got brown garden waste. That's like end of the season stuff. Um, the biggest thing is never put in anything that has become diseased. So all your zucchini plants get, you know, shrivel up at the end of the year and your squash plants and your tomato plants or anything like that. If it's brown, you could put it in as a brown. But realize if it died unnaturally early, in my opinion, like a tomato plant that decide, died mysteriously in July, that is diseased in some way, don't put it in. One of the biggest reasons is you need to understand in a backyard pile, what you put in is what you're gonna get out. Our piles are low, cool, a low temperature, cooler piles. They're gonna be 60 to 80 degrees at the most. So as a result, we're not gonna get to the temperatures to kill certain things that um, commercial operations get to. So there's certain things you don't wanna put in your backyard pile. Anything diseased, don't put in your backyard pile. Um, twigs and sticks. Realize the woodier and denser something is, the longer it's going to take to break down. So think about it. Like how quickly is an avocado pit going to break down versus a leaf? Big difference. Same with that twig and stick, that woody, tent, you know, particularly if it's a bigger round one, it, it's going to take a little while, but it will break down. You do have to follow the same rules though. If you're collecting sticks in your yard and you have a whole nice bundle and you want to put them in, they still have to be this small to put in, okay? Wood chip pieces or mulch, just don't put anything in that's chemically treated or colored, again, because what you put in is what you're gonna get out. So if they've painted that with red or gray paint or something like that, you're gonna be essentially putting paint and chemicals in your compost pile. Obviously not something you wanna do for the health of the soil, so don't do that. Um, look at straws, the next one on there. Notice opposite or just down from it is hay. Some look alike. Straw is a straw, the brown straw, but it has no seed head. Hay will still maybe be a little green, but the key difference is it has the seed head on it. That's what makes it a green and nitrogen, whereas a straw doesn't. So some look similar. Try to know what you're putting into your bed, into your compost pile. Next is the dried out animal bedding on the browns. Now we need to talk about this. Manure is tough. This is all about using manure or bedding used with animals. So the first thing you need to know, only if bedding is 100% dried out and it no longer smells in any way like um, manure or urine or anything like that, would it be a brown? Most of the time, you're gonna think of it as manure, which if you see under is under the greens, but notice it is plant eaters only. It is not any kind of meat eater, so it's not your cat or your dog, it's not you or me, does not matter if you are a vegetarian, you cannot pee or poop on your pile. You should not pee or poop on your pile, so let's be clear. But just know, if you want to use manure, I highly recommend having a separate pile for that because our rules around 50-50 by volume don't work the same way. Um, when you're talking a plant eater manure, we're talking goats, um, sheep, cows, chickens, horses. Um, but that's the kind of thing we're talking about. And you've got to let a lot of it age, which means more of the nitrogen is dissipating off. It basically throws off that 50-50 ratio. So it's tough to work with. Don't use it unless you really have to. If you have more questions about manure, put them in the chat and we'll address them after that. But I just need to say it's tough. I don't recommend using it unless you really have to. Um, back here under the browns, paper napkins, facial tissues, paper towels. Since in Boulder County, we can't put those in commercial compost anymore. Backyard pile, great source of browns. But realize a couple things. If you use paper napkins, if you use the white ones, they've usually been bleached with hydrogen peroxide. That does not concern me, but I don't have anybody who's chemically sensitive at my house. If you have someone who's chemically sensitive, be aware of that. 
if you are going to put in things like napkins or facial tissues, try to use the brown ones if possible. If that's something um, you are going to plan to use, just be aware of it. If there's nothing wrong with it, but I just always like to point that out if that is something you plan to use. The next one down here, which sounds kind of weird, but like you got an old cotton t-shirt that is kind of just rags at this point, cut it up into small one to two inch pieces and throw it in your compost pile. And right below it, dryer lint. That also doesn't feel like came from a living or once living thing, but remember that's a cotton t-shirt is overwhelmingly and cotton towels and stuff are what give off lint. It's not the artificial fabrics. So came from a living or once living thing. Got to remember, sometimes that feels far away, but it still is. It's a small amount. It's tiny. But if you got it, throw it in versus throwing it in the trash. It's just a way to use it. The next two on here, the shredded cardboard containers and the newspaper. You can use them. However, I recommend recycling them first. Compost is really ultimate destruction. When you look at that picture that we are looking at of compost, and even this is my compost from my worm bin, you cannot tell what went into that. Was that coffee grounds, eggshells, banana peels, tomatoes, peppers? It doesn't look like any of that anymore. Compost is ultimate destruction. In fact, if you don't know, fun fact, the federal government even thinks that. They take all the paper money here in Denver at the mint that comes out of circulation and they thread it to, um, they shred it to a thickness of a toothpick and they compost it to ensure it never goes back into circulation. So realize you, you should be unrecognizable when you compost something. But things like paper, newspaper, cardboard, we can recycle and those can be turned into recycled cardboard boxes again or newspaper again. And we can get a couple lives out of it before maybe it ultimately ends up in a compost bin. Now, that being said, if you don't have a lot of browns, you may have to use them your first year until you save your stash of leaves this fall. But just know if you do, you got to follow a couple rules. Still one inch strips or so. I just tear it by hand when you do that. You want to do the porous newsprint parts only, none of the glossy ads business. And don't worry if it has color in the ink. By law, those are all soy based ink, so you don't have to worry about them. I wouldn't do a cardboard container with lots of shine, lots of print on it. But you know, I'll be honest, most Amazon boxes don't have a lot of print. And you're probably going to be fine. Notice what's right below there, there is dried pine needles. And it says only small amounts. Please know pine needles are not the same as leaves. They are very acidic. You can put a few in, but not a lot. A few to me means I'm raking up my yard of leaves at the end of the year. A few of my pine needles from my pine trees have gotten mixed in. I do not need to sort them out. That is fine, but I cannot rake up the bed of pine needles under my pine trees. That is too much. So just a little bit mixed in with your leaves is fine, but you can't do a lot. And then sawdust, this is about how small it is. Um, um, you first of all only want to put in any kind of untreated wood if you did. And the other thing about sawdust is it's really small particles. And what happens is when they get wet, they'll just like turn into a pancake in your bin. So they don't help a lot. I'm talking a small amount too, like you did a little project with some untreated wood and you've got this little pile you sweep together in your garage, you could throw that in your compost pile. But if you're a woodworker by trade, you can't possibly put all of your wood sawdust in. All right, let's talk about some of the greens. So we've talked about some of these already that, you know, when we're talking the green tree or plant leaves, that's really what I mean by, like I said, if it's a green leaf when it comes down or, or it gets trimmed, then you can put it in. Um, but if it's if you like trimmed your house plant leaf because it got all brown and shriveled up, that leaf would be a brown, not a green. So next one I really want to point out to you is the fruit and veggie scraps from your kitchen. So I consider everything that comes out of my kitchen to be a green. Now, technically, I am throwing in some things that would be a brown. So for example, first of all, this is my compost pail. It looks filthy most of the time. It is just an old dishwasher tab, nothing fancy. You don't need anything fancy to collect your kitchen scraps in. I just wanna say that you don't need one of those little $30 Crocs with a little lid, unless you really want to. All they have is a carbon um, filter lid if you really want one, but otherwise any container works. So don't worry about that. I just take stuff right off my cutting board and scrape it in. 
I'm putting in all the stuff that I'm basically not eating. I'm putting in the holes of the peppers. I'm pulling stems, putting in stems off of spinach. I'm putting in spinach that got a little slimy in the bag. I'm putting in wedges of lemon and um, lime. That's one of the internet myths that says you shouldn't put citrus in. You can, as long as we're talking, and in all this stuff, we're talking your normal household usage. So you're cooking with a few limes or lemons. Um, I would try to have them be wedge size. So if you use a half of them, I would cut it in half before I would um, put it into my bin so it's ready to go. So it stays closer to that one to two inch size. That's fine. But if you should not put in all the oranges from making three bushels of oranges to make marmalade at your house. That would be too much. It's all about the acidity when it comes to citrus. A little is fine, a lot is too much. So just normal household usage. But I put in avocados. Now, technically the avocado pit would be a brown, but I don't worry about that. I just throw it into my bin. Yeah, it's part of that volume, but I'm trusting it's all going to work out because this is where that variety diet helps. Um, I'm putting in the avocado skin. I'm putting in um, leftover pasta that we didn't eat without a sauce on it. I'm putting in next, right next there, the coffee grounds and filters. Now, first of all, I said filters. Filters would be a brown in this case, technically, but I don't worry about that because that's super thin. What the value is, is the coffee grounds. Now, notice coffee grounds are not green. They are brown. Don't be confused. It's one of the few color exceptions and it's really small particles because it's all ground up. I know, but you need to know coffee grounds and eggshells are worms two favorite foods. So we put them in. Now, that being said, I'm talking your normal household usage. Even if you work from home these days and you drink one or two pots of coffee all day, fine. But don't bring home all the coffee grounds from like your 500 employee office that you go to three days a week. That's too much. Your normal household usage would work. Same with tea bags. Tea bags can go in and the, um, the bag and the tea. Now, please know that um, if nowadays there's some fancier tea bags that are out that are nylon bags. They're those pretty little satchels almost looking. Those will not compost. The other kind that come from like Celestial Seasoning or Lipton, those all will compost. Don't worry about you if you've got a kind with a string on it. Strings are made of cotton. That little piece of paper will compost the staple it will disappear in the ether. Don't worry about it, throw it in. Um, but if you do have any of those with those little nylon satchels, you will have to snip that open and empty out the tea contents. Also, if you do loose leaf tea, obviously you can just throw that in. That also looks brown, but it's a green because it's high in nitrogen. And the reason I like to use the colors, it just really helps you to remember mostly the time what you're doing. The words carbon and nitrogen don't mean much to most of us. So I like to use the browns and greens. So really stick to that and that'll help you. Eggshells, I am just cracking an egg and then with the two shells together in my hand, I give it a little crunch and then I throw it into my bin. I do do that even though it makes the little pieces smaller than one to two inches in size, but the eggshells are gonna take the longest to compost. You're gonna see those in your compost all the way to the end. In fact, if you look carefully, I don't know if you can see it, I have a couple little pieces of eggshell even in my own little worm compost right here. I consider it finished if there's even little pieces of eggshell in there because they won't hurt where they're going when you mix them into your garden. And if you wait till they finish, it'll be a while and everything else is ready. So that's why I don't worry about that. Consider it done if you see little bits of eggshell still. But eggshells, you don't think of as a green either, but they're still high in nitrogen, which is why they go on the green side. Breads and pastas. Um, so one thing about breads and pastas, came from a living or once living thing. Think back to the wheat. Now, the key thing is, is don't put anything that's got fats or oils or sauces on it, but you know, you got a moldy piece of bread and it's all dried out and you're not gonna use it, tear up the little pieces and throw it in your bin, but still do the pieces one to two inches in size. Don't leave it as a hunk of bread. Also, you should just know in general, fats, oils and sauces and meat and bones cannot go into your backyard pile. Eggshells are the only animal product allowed in your backyard pile. Not because they won't break down, 
But again, because we have wildlife in Colorado, especially, and I, when I mean wildlife, I could mean anything from a mouse to a rat, to a fox, a raccoon, or even a bear or a mountain lion. So we're trying to cover all the bases there. We don't want to put anything out that's going to attract those kind of critters to your pile. So that's why we're telling you certain things to put in or not put in. And so with that in mind, if that pasta has this great luscious tomato sauce on it, you can't put it in your backyard pile. Okay. Um, we talked about hair, uh, hay and manure, sorry. So let's just point out hair came from a living or once living thing. That's pretty obvious, except where do you get that from? Well, first of all, you're cleaning up your dog and cat hair all the time off the sofa or vacuuming or, or you know, petting them and you got this wad left, throw it in your bin. It's a great green source. In fact, um, barbershops and actually pet grooming places is a good place where you can get extra greens of hair. Also, similarly, your vacuum waste. If you happen to have a bagless vacuum, if you have a bag vacuum, this does not apply, but if you have a bagless vacuum, what it picks up overwhelmingly is hair, dead skin cells. That's overwhelming what it is. Now, you can just throw and empty that into your compost pile. Now, that being said, if you know you picked up your kids like Lego piece, pull it out. You don't want those plastic pieces in there, but overwhelmingly what you should get should be organic material, hair or dead skin cells. Yellow jack jacket traps. If you got those and they fill up during the summer and you got all these dead insects, throw them in. They're a green source for your pile. Now let's talk about weeds. Um, weeds everybody always wants to talk about. So a couple things. First of all, you should never put any weeds that have gone to seed in your bin, okay? Oops, let me do that, it's better. Okay, first of all, a weed that has gone to seed is almost impossible to kill. Certainly it's not gonna die in our backyard pile. A weed that has gone to seed, and a weed that has gone to seed for me is like a dandelion that turned into the puffy snowball, you know, you can do that with. That's a weed that has gone to seed, to give you an idea. If you put that in your backyard pile, I guarantee there's no chance that sucker's gonna die, and I guarantee it's gonna transfer wherever you use that compost. That's why we don't want you to put weeds that have gone to seed. Weeds that have gone to seed will need to get to about 130 to 140 degrees for three consecutive days to, um, get hot enough to actually kill the seed. The problem is, is that our backyard piles, especially in Colorado, 60 to 80 tops. Only 80s really when you add the fresh greens. So as a result, you're never, ever, ever, ever gonna get enough to kill a weed that has gone to seed. Commercial compost operations, they can handle that. They have a whole different process than we do. They do them in windrows and giant piles. Um, they can handle things we can't. So that's a good one to send to a commercial compost. Now, that being said, I don't put any weeds in my backyard pile, partly because again, your backyard pile, what you put into it is what you get out of it. Weeds that haven't gone to seed may die in the pile, but may not. And I have just found, particularly with the noxious weeds, especially like thistle, bindweed, they pretty much never seem to die no matter what you do. So I don't risk it. I'm trying to keep my yard as weed free as I possibly can naturally and um, organically. So I don't put any of those in. Those are ones I do send to, um, to the commercial compost operation. If you really, really, really wanna put some weeds into your backyard pile, the one thing you can do is take advantage of the sun, gather all your weeds that you want to put in your backyard pile, pull out any weeds that have gone to seed, and put those in commercial compost or trash, but then take the rest and lay them out on sidewalk, on blacktop, on concrete patio, something that the sun is gonna get super hot and just let the sun um, bake the heck out of them for a couple of days. And they're gonna get all shriveled up and wrinkly, but you're still gonna count them as a green because then you would throw them into the bin. You're basically trying to get them up to that temperature to kill them before you even get them into the bin. And then they would finish breaking down in the bin. I can't guarantee that's not that's not gonna pass them on. Um, but just know, if I were you, I wouldn't risk it after you do all that work on a flower bed or a garden bed or your potted plants, I, I wouldn't risk it. And if you have commercial compost as an option, it's a great way to use it. So if you look at the list on the breast of here, um, just notice the ones on the two black columns here under do not backyard compost, that's all stuff you also cannot compost another way. So be careful about a few of these things out there. 
most of these are relatively obvious, but let's be clear, like a plastic coated paper. What that is, is that's like a paper Starbucks cup. That is not compostable. The cup might've been made of paper, but it's been plastic coated now to hold a hot beverage, which means it's not compostable anymore. Because what's gonna happen is when that gets chopped up, it's gonna put little micro shards of plastic into that compost pile. So that's why things like that or plastic coated paper plates can't go in, all that stuff you can't put it in, can't be composted commercially or in your backyard pile. That was the same even before all the new regulations here in Boulder County. The other thing I point out always is be careful about kitty litter. Sometimes kitty litter is labeled as, as compostable and it is when you buy it brand new from the store. And the minute your cat poops or pees in it, it's not compostable anymore. So they just put it on there thinking, you'll think you're doing something good for the environment and buy it. But unfortunately, that's not how this works. So be careful of things like that. Don't put any ash into your um, backyard pile and in the commercial compost either. Um, that's not, once you've burned something, you've burned up most of its nutrient value. Um, you can't compost shredded office paper. It does not take the place of shredded newspaper. Office paper is made to repel water. The only kind of water pro uh, paper products that you can put in your bin are ones that are meant to soak up water. Paper towels, paper napkins, facial tissue. So think of it that way. If it's gonna repel any kind of liquid, you do not want it in your backyard pile. And of course, the compostable tableware that we've um, gotten used to from zero waste events, those are not going to break down in your backyard pile either. While they are compostable, they're only meant to break down at those temperatures a commercial operation gets to. Our backyard piles will not handle them, so you cannot put them into your backyard pile either. Only these items in the green box here can you really put in a commercial operation. And again, notice the grease, fat, oils, meat, some bones. That's all great things to put in a compost, commercial compost, because you can't put that in your backyard pile. Because again, that's the stuff that tracked pests. All right, I'm going to stop sharing. We're going to answer all these other questions I see that are popping up into the chat. Because I know there's always a ton of questions. Chandra, do you want to start calling them out and I go back and look at any else here? Yeah, um, Christine asked, she said, we, I think we might have figured out the question. Christine said, I've had my compost bin for two years and the coffee filters are not degrading. Is there a specific coffee filter better than others? I recommended also tearing them up into smaller pieces, right? That's, that's exactly what I would say. I would tear them up because they're pretty thin. And the other thing is, is you're probably not keeping the pile damp enough. We'll talk about that when we talk mm -hmm. about water. That's probably mm -hmm. part of the reason they're drying out, so. Okay, Veronica asked about ashes, but we went over that. Yep. Um, Leticia asked, pompous grass leaves, are they a brown? I don't know what pompous grass leaves are. I think it's like the really like, um, <laughs> somebody can explain this better than me. Um, they're like the really big, tall grasses. Oh, yeah, totally. Those would totally, now they're usually brown at the end of the season. So I would count them as a brown. It's kind of like, um, you know, anything, you know, that would get brown. If, if you trimmed them for some reason, they're green, they'd be a green. But yeah, absolutely. I wouldn't be concerned about that at all. Um, and then moldy bread. Absolutely. A hundred percent. And don't worry if anything molds in advance, like in your little compost thing or anything like that. That's just like it working for you in advance. It's great. So don't worry about anything molding. <laughs> okay. Oh, two people asked about the avocado pits. So I'll be honest, avocado pits take a while, but they will break down. Um, I just go ahead and throw them in. And part of what I do when I'm getting finished compost out, which we'll talk about, is you hand sort out maybe the things you recognize. And avocado pits will be one of those things you'll still see. They're going to get softer. They will break down, though. Um, the skin gets kind of leathery. I know that. That's also what happens in Colorado. But if you keep them mixed in with everything and you keep the pile moist enough, they will break down. And yeah, they're impossible to crush, right? You couldn't. Yes, they are impossible to crush. Right. I would not crush. I don't know how you crush them. I think <laughs> maybe sometimes you can get them to cut in half, but more power to if you can do that. Okay. I never do that. Um, cooked rice without sauce or oil. Totally good. That would okay. be a that would be a green, just like breads and pastas. Okay. Um, we answered the the oil question. Um, tomato sauce without meat. Tomato sauce, 
I still would probably not. Um, it depends on how heavily sauced it is, I'll be honest. If it's a little bit and it's in a variety of other stuff in your kitchen, you'll probably be fine. But if it's a really oily tomato-y sauce, like where you can see the oil glinting on the sauce, I would probably steer clear because the oils are the stuff that has the strongest odors that are gonna attract critters to your pile. And that's the concern. And then um, are co coconut shells compostable? Yes, they are, definitely. Okay, would they be a green? green? They would be a green. Okay, that's all the ones for... Um, doo -doo -doo. And can I see a couple things that I'll mention? Somebody asked yeah. about kitty box cleanouts. That is feces that cannot go in. Yep. I definitely, a, a Najwa, uh, I'm sorry I mispronounced your name, but it says I would avoid anything in contact with pet feces. And I would agree with that. I don't use manure. That's why I really steer people clear from manure unless you really have to. But for some people, they have a lot of volume if they have a lot of chickens or horses. And like I said, if you have specific questions about that, if you are a person who has that, Really what I recommend is having a whole separate pile where you deal with just any kind of manure product, whether it's bedding or manure, and then you kind of work. That way it's not really getting in contact with your food waste and stuff. And you might selectively use that compost in something where you're not gonna grow anything you might eat, if that makes any sense. All right, is that most of those? Yeah, that's all the ones that relate to browns versus greens. The other ones you're gonna get to. Okay, uh, well, then I'm gonna- Christine just asked about scraps of meat, no meat. No meat in your backyard pile. Cause yeah. again, that's the stuff that will attract things to your pile. I mean, and part of what I'm trying to do is like, you're gonna have this pile in your backyard. You do not wanna open it up and find that like some mice have decided to live in your pile or worse, the foxes have been getting into your pile because there's some meat in there that sounds delicious, smells delicious to them. So, 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 okay. I'm going to go ahead and keep going. Wait, uh, Raquel okay? just asked about composting toilets. Can you, would you have a separate one for that? That is a whole another ball game. That is biosolids. That is not what we're talking about. You cannot put compost toilet stuff in a backyard pile. Yeah. Whole different animal. Um, that's all considered biosolids. There's actually a biosolid facility in Louisville, Colorado um, and stuff. And so, but that has to be handled a whole different way. So just steer clear of it um, unless we're talking animal manure. That's only kind we can really talk about. So, all right, I'm gonna keep us going guys because we've got lots to cover. So next we are going to talk about air and water now i really have to diagram some things for you which is why i have this whiteboard behind me so let me talk to you about it first and then we will go from there so first thing is um there's not much about this in your handouts because it's really hard to put this down it's really just on that page of essentials on page two of your handouts but these are essential things that you have to do, but yet you really have to do them to understand what it really means. So that's why I wanna use the diagram to help explain this. So the first one we're gonna talk about is water. So remember, we just talked about food, what you feed your compost pile with some food waste and yard waste. Now we're gonna talk about the water part. Your water content in your bin ideally should be damp as a wrung out sponge all the time. That's the amount of water we want our pile to have. So what does that really mean? That means like if you squeeze your pile, it should be damp enough that a few, when you let it go, a few particles may stick to your hand, but not enough that like water is running down your arm. To me, that is damp as a wrung out sponge. That's what you're trying to go for in your bin. That's ideally the best water content. Why? Water really matters in your bin because remember the guys who are actually in there doing the work, eating the stuff you put in. Those are single celled organisms. They can move around from water droplet to water droplet. But if the water, if there's no water there, they can't physically move around. And remember, if they aren't there, the second and third level guys are not coming either. Also, Worms, they were the second level guys. They breathe through their skin, which is covered with water. And so that means if your pile dries out, they really cannot breathe and they will leave the pile. So you really have to keep a pile moist enough, but the right amount of moisture. And this is honestly the hardest thing to do here in Colorado. So I'm just gonna say right up front, 
Most people's problems often can be tied to keeping that 50-50 mix of green and browns and keeping their pile moist enough. Now, so let's talk about how you actually test for this and how you water your pile. So I'm gonna diagram my bin as if we could see a side profile of the bin. So there, okay. So let's just imagine here's my bin. It's full to here, okay? Full with all kinds of stuff, okay? So this is my bin. If I'm gonna open it up and look down into it this way, I guarantee it's gonna look dry if I trust, just try to do it by looking, okay? Because in Colorado especially, we have a dry, arid climate. And what's happening constantly in your bin is that it's evap water is evaporating out the sides, which means you're constantly losing water. And even out the top, even with a nice tight fitting lid, which means, oops, that was a little too close to the edge. This is the most active part of the pile. That circle in the middle is where the critters actually hang out and where all the activity happens. Because in this area all around here, it's gonna be drying out. And remember, they can't live in that environment. So I guarantee if I open the lid and I look down and I see this surface, it's part of that dry area, I'm gonna say, oh, the pile's dry. That may not be true. So when you're gonna water your pile, the first thing you have to do is not actually water it, but to actually stir it. You wanna stir it with a pitchfork a flat time pitchfork like this. So you literally are coming in from the top, going into your bin like that, and you are trying to stir it like it's a great big bowl of brownie mix. So just an even out that moisture content so that you're trying to get, there's no more lime here. It's all mixed up. You get in there with your pitchfork and you're turning it all around. And then, then you do something I call the squeeze test where literally I stick my hand right down the middle here and grab some of the compost and pull it out, squeeze it, and then drop it back into the bin. Did any of the particles stick to my hand? If not, it's not damp as a wrung out sponge. And so I have to water it. Now how you water your compost pile is super important. It needs to be close enough to the hose. Don't put this bin in the back corner of the yard where you tell yourself you'll carry a five gallon bucket out there to water it because you just will not do it. Instead, what you wanna do is get your hose out, have it running in your hand. I like to use a barrel style handle um, so I can have it running without me touching it. Don't leave on like a trigger handle where you have to squeeze. We're not gonna spray from the top. We need this hose to be able to run without us touching it. And then you take that hose and you put it right back down into the middle of the bin, right there. And you leave it there for like a good minute. And then you pull the hose out. You get your pitchfork out. You even out that moisture content throughout the whole bin. So you're mixing all that water up. Then do it again, put my hand right down in the middle, grab some, squeeze it, let it go. Is it damp enough now it's sticking to my hand a little bit? If it's not, you do it again. And you do that until it is damp as a wrung out sponge. That is watering your bin. Now, the convenient thing is while you're dealing with water, you are also addressing the air issue. Remember we said we need food, water, air, and shelter. So this also addresses the air. Because here's what's going on. Again, this is my cross section of my bin. So let's just say my bin was full or pretty close to full to start, okay? So what I did is when I wanted to test for the moisture content, the first thing I did was stick my, my pitchfork in and I mix the whole thing up. When you're doing all of that, you're adding air. So by the time you are done doing this whole watering thing, you've stirred your bin a couple of good times 
and you've added air into your pile. Because what happened is if the bin started off this high, within a couple of weeks, it's not that high anymore. Maybe now it's down to here. What happened? Those one to two inch size pieces that we were putting in are not one to two inch size pieces anymore. They might be 15 sixteenths, you know, a little bit has been nibbled off of all of them and they've started to compress. The pile actually compresses and those one to two inch size pieces create some natural forming air pockets between the particles, which is why one to two inches is the right size. You don't want to go smaller than that. One to two inches is the right size. So it's just kind of the whole pile kind of compressed. And then when we got in there with the pitchfork, we mixed it all up. We made sure it was damp as wrung out sponge. By the time we're done with all of that, this is not the level of my bin anymore. Maybe it's up to here. I don't know if my, my marker, there we go. We go away for a week or two. We come back. Now my pile is down to here. That pile compressed. We need to do our squeeze test for water. So we do the stir thing and then we squeeze test and maybe water it. And by the time we're all done, we fluff it back up and it's back up to here, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that a full bin of stuff will ultimately end up with about a third to a half of finished compost. So what I just described, and this is why it's so hard to describe this, is the maintenance part of composting. Once you fill a bin up, you can keep adding to it but you're also gonna to have to start maintaining it, doing this water, stirring, and air. How often do you do this? You gotta do this at least once a month. It's best if you can do it once a week. That's the best. You don't need to do it more than once a week, but if you can do it every week to 10 days, that's just gonna keep your critters extra happy. They got plenty of moisture, they got plenty of air, and then they can do what they do. Um, so the reason I say once a month, if you aren't out there once a month, two things are going to happen. First of all, the pile is going to dry out. All this evaporation we're talking about, it's just going to slowly evaporate the most of the moisture out the sides of your bin, no matter how tight your bin is. Um, and we'll talk about bins in a minute. There are some that are tighter than others that help, but you're still going to naturally lose some moisture. But then what also is going to happen is if you keep adding food waste on a regular basis from your kitchen and you never go out and turn the pile, someone's going to make it their home, someone you don't want. So by that, I mean, if I was a mouse and I was trying to find a place to have babies and if I could get my way into your bin and two, three times a week, you brought me some food and you never bothered me, I probably would think about having my babies there. But if you're out there once a week, stirring up my house with these very sharp objects, I will think about making my home somewhere else. And that's why this is so important. Not only does it take care of water and air, this is also how you don't have things in your bin you don't want. They should not get in there if you're maintaining your bin well. So no, this is the work part. You have to do it. We'll talk about some different bin styles, um, about if that really is a, like turn tumbler bins, if that's really a solution. Um, but you just need to know, you gotta get out there and maintain it with the water and the air with the turning. Um, but I can't say enough, have your uh, bin close enough to the hose to water it. I am moving my bin right now to the other side of the yard. And the first thing I'm doing is getting an extra long hose so that the faucet on that side will reach my bin. It's an absolute. Um, I'm just telling you right now that is set yourself up for success. Don't worry about making it close to the house. My Where my bin was, was like four steps off my patio. I just had to move it because we had to put a new fence in. So do it. You will be so glad if you have that for a hose. I'm gonna check in for a second about, okay, I think we're okay. So I'm gonna jump ahead to bins if that's okay. So I'm gonna go back to screen sharing some of the handouts because the next handout in your packet is actually all about bins. Oh, sorry, I skipped one, but I'll tell you about this. So the backside of the browns and greens is where to get extra compost material. 
I just want to say it is helpful to start with a volume initially for your bin. What I mean by that is you can start with a teeny bit of greens and a teeny bit of browns and just see how you accumulate it. But you should know until that bin is a good like half full, it's just not really worth the critters while to come and live in your bin. And our goal is for them not just to visit, but to live in our bin. And you just keep feeding them and they just keep eating and pooping. That's our goal. So sometimes it's helpful to start with a few more materials just to get that volume going. And then you can keep adding from your own stash. So there's lots of choices for greens. You'll see everything we've talked about like barbers and pet groomers for hair grocery stores. Um, particularly my favorites to get are juice bars and coffee shops. They usually have lots of coffee grounds, um, lots of wheatgrass and orange rinds and stuff like that. And it's so fine to put a volume in like that one time and then add your normal household amounts after that. I wouldn't keep getting them from them every time, but it's helpful to kind of start that volume. As for the browns, please note, it's tough this time of the year to find browns. So the first thing I would do is look around your own yard or talk to your friends and neighbors. Do they have leaves stuck up against the fence? I just just uh, cleaned up a whole bunch of mine today because I know about you, but you know, leaves were just down and it was October when we had our first snowfall. And then it's like, you forgot all about doing anything with that until you look at that. And there's a whole ton of them there. So grab those. Um, and then this fall, save some leaves. I save at least two to three bags of brown leaves for um, every compost pile I plan to use. And we'll talk about that because some people end up with two piles maybe eventually, but at least two to three bags. And I'm just saving them in a plain old black trash bag. I tie it up at the top. I, I bagged mine up last fall. The bag I noticed today has got probably six or eight hole, little toe holes in it. That's fine. Remember, once a brown, always a brown. Doesn't matter if they get wet and slimy. They'll be good to go all summer long. And then this fall, I'll save more. Now, this spring, you may have to get more creative and looking around or even look online, see if a Facebook marketplace or someplace like that, free stuff, somebody might have some, they're happy to let someone come and come take their leaves. And then this fall, maybe go to the leaf drop-offs or yard waste collections or check with your neighbors and save your own stash of leaves. But unfortunately, the browns are not as easy to get sometimes, so save them when you can get them. All right, so let's talk bins. Everybody always wants to know. So let's talk about good, bad about bins. So the first thing is the bin in the green box that you see is the number one bin I recommend. I personally own two of them. Now I'll be honest, they're hard to get now. We'll talk about that here in a minute, but I'm gonna tell you about why I like this bin, why we found it works really well in Boulder County. And if you don't wanna get this bin, I'll talk to you about why get something similar if you can find it. So here's why this one is good. So the first thing I like about this bin is this has solid wall construction. These are each a panel. So if you can see, this is like a, a square, a cube standing upright and it is each of those are a panel, okay? So you want something that is that, that is not stacking pieces. There are some that look a lot like this, but then it's actually a stacking piece sitting on top of stacking pieces. That's a problem because remember, our bins may sit half empty a lot of the times. So you don't want anything where a good strong bear or raccoon can knock off the top half, top half of your bin. You want something where the whole wall is a solid piece, okay? Next, you have to have something with a locking, tight fitting lid on your bin. Now that can be a lid you make even, it could be an old piece of carpet or cardboard, but you have to strap it down because we have wind here in Colorado. And I guarantee if you do not tighten it down, it will not stay down. Now I'm not a big fan of the lid, of the uh, lids that are like a, uh, like a, uh, not a, like a bottle top or a jar lid top that screws on. Sometimes they feel like you got it on tight, but then you didn't quite get the threads lined up and they don't always stay. The reason I like this one, it actually has like a little like lever that actually swings out and actually locks into place under it. So I try to get that if you can. Also notice this bin doesn't have very many vent holes. The only few holes you really can see are these few down here. And I can tell you, they're about the size of the tip of my pinky. These are not big holes. 
That works really well here in Colorado because remember we're trying to reduce the evaporation for moisture loss and we're keeping little paws out. Some of the bins out there that are labeled as some of the best ones will have like a two or three inch hole on, you know, throughout it. Well, that's just an invitation here in Colorado for some wildlife to come and chow on what's in your bin. So don't get anything like that. Plus it's gonna dry out like crazy. So you want something with very small, few holes. You also need something with pretty thick plastic. Um, I'd like to use the plastic or something, but it's gotta have a thick material. There are some out there that are really thin plastic. And you're gonna be in there with this tool, banging around against the sides, pushing up against the bin. So you need something that's gonna hold up. So I find the thicker plastic or thicker material really helps. The other thing about this that I like is this one is held together with actual nuts and bolts. See the little silver circle you can see there? Now, I'll be that being said, a lot of them nowadays come with plastic nuts and bolts. Don't even use them. If you live in Boulder County and you get one of those, Take the nuts and bolts little baggy as it comes, walk straight to McGuckin's, go to the hardware department and spend like $4 and get galvanized steel bolts of the equivalent. They have them in stock all the time because we've sent hundreds and hundreds of people there. Don't try to use the plastic ones. We have found they break within a year. Um, get the real steel ones and you will be fine. There are ones that look like this bin out there, but they will have interlocking plastic tabs in the corner. Unless those tabs actually completely like it's the kind where they, once they go together, you can never take them apart. I don't like those because I find that those work great when the bin is empty. And then again, when I'm in there with that pitchfork pushing against the side, those corners just like fly apart. So don't, if you can help it, get anything with those kind of corners or something that's not reinforced on the outside. Also, this bin here has no bottom. This is these four cube pieces and a lid on top. There's no bottom. This sits directly on the ground, on the dirt, not on your patio, not even on gravel, not even on weed cloth. It needs to sit directly on the dirt so that the critters who live in the top three inches of the soil come right from the soil right up into your pile. So make sure it has no bottom. Don't put any kind of plate on them. Sometimes I'll have something called a rodent plate with it to try to make it um, easier for you to, to feel you know, like you're not gonna get mice in your bin. The best defense is that good maintenance. It's not one of those plates. And it, I like this square shape. I've just found it really holds up better than any of the circular ones because the circular ones, um, I find that once something cracks in it, it's hard to hold it together. Whereas I feel like the structure seems to hold better in this square shape. So be aware um, of the features to avoid here. No kind of anything that has a loose lid that doesn't latch down, that is not gonna work well. Um, also, you've got to um, make sure it doesn't have those large holes, direct contact, and also get ones that's straight up and down if you can. Don't get anything that narrows more pyramid shaped at the top. Try to get it to be more straight up and down. Now you'll notice I have on here tumbling and turning bends are features to avoid. So I put a picture of one on here for you. That's one, that's a double kind that has two different compartments. There are some that have that as one compartment. I'll be honest, I am not a fan of these guys at all. So the first thing you have to think about is how do the critters get in there? This is not in direct contact with the ground. These guys do not jump. You will have to put in a few handfuls of soil or compost to get them in. The other thing that I find about these guys is they often have little vent holes, just like our bin does, but those act as drain holes when you go to water it. But one of the biggest frustrations about these guys is that everything just kind of gets into this big lump. And then when you go to turn it, the lump as a whole just shifts kind of back and forth and it doesn't actually turn up. Even those that have augers on the inside, like little spindles that's supposed to pass through and break up some of the compost, I find they don't really work. You still have to get in there with your hands and really break it up by hand. I have found that these only really work for people who live 
at home all the time, do not travel. And they're very committed to going out and turning them one time a day, not a week, a day. One full rotation every day seems to keep them going once you get them going. But that's it. That's got to be every day. So I just find that doesn't work for most people's schedules. Most people who have those end up getting frustrated by them. And they're also quite expensive. So I'm, I mean, at least $150 to $200. So I'm not a huge fan. And the biggest thing is life is going to happen. You're going to get busy. You're going to get your compost pile going and you're going to be like, okay, I'm on it. And then somebody in your family gets sick. You go on a vacation and three months goes by and you're like, oh yeah, my compost bin. So what's going to happen in a backyard bin? This is directly in contact with the ground. Where are the critters going to go when it gets all dry in there? The guys who can move, they're going to go back into the soil. They're going to leave. And then when you come back from whatever's going on and you get that pile going again, those critters are gonna come back up into the bin and keep doing their job. But in a tumbler bin like this, where do the critters go when life happens and the pile dries out and you don't maintain it? They die in it. And then to get it going, you have to introduce them again. So that's one of the biggest reasons I'm not a big fan. They tend to dry out very quickly. They tend to be difficult to maintain. Um, now, I will be honest, if you're like, oh, no, I just bought one of those at Home Depot this weekend. Um, so here's one option. Sometimes people end up with two bins and they'll have a good one like on the ground like this. And once the bin gets going, they'll take the whole contents and move it to the tumbler bin and then keep it going from there and then start from scratch on this bin. So if you have one of those, it's a way you can use it. You can also use it to store your leaves in the fall, um, but I'm not a fan, I'll just be honest. Now we need to talk about the unfortunateness of the soil saver. The company who was making it just announced that they have stopped making it now and it's no longer available. The county used to be able to sell these to you at bulk cost, steel, and we can't get them anymore. Literally the county does not have any more. So, there's still a few out there. Buy one if you at all are thinking about it. Because I'll be honest, I've been trying to find another bin as a replacement and I can't find one I like near as well. You currently can get one. It's called the Soil Saver. Seems to be on Amazon, Home Depot, or Wayfair, but only online. You're not going to find these in any store. It's basically, you know, these folks' warehouses, if they still have some, that's where they seem to be. But All Green is not making them anymore. And the one they've given us as a replacement is not a great option. So we're looking. We're looking for the next good bin to recommend to you guys. So if anybody has a bin they really love, I would love to hear more about that. Throw that into the chat because let me tell you, we've been scouring the internet. I've been looking at gardener um, companies trying to figure out. And there's some I found that are not bad. But they're $300. And I don't want you guys to spend that kind of money until you know composting is really what you want to do. For a lot of you, this is newish. And so the goal is for you not to spend a ton of money and then hate it um, because it's just not working for you. We want to set you up with a bin that's going to work well and that's not going to cost you a ton of money. I will say there is another bin I kind of like. It's this one right here called the Earth Machine or sometimes called the compost machine. It looks like a Darth Vader head when you take the stickers off. So that is an option. However, I like it because it's cheap. The problem is, is they don't tend to hold up as well. So you can buy a cheaper option like this. It's like two circles that sit on top of each other. And we find that what happens is after a few years, the little plastic tabs that hold it together don't always hold it together so well. So I've seen people where like those little slits on the side, they end up wiring it together to try to kind of hold it together. Um, and it does have that screw on lid on the top, but it tends to be 70 bucks, something like that. So it's one of the more inexpensive ones but it only is gonna last a few years. So that is another option right now if you want, um, but it is not my favorite. You just need to know you're gonna definitely replace it. And be aware, see this blue part on here? See this picture right here where they show the food waste you're just gonna add at the top. And they have these cute little doors on here where just magically the compost is gonna fall out. 
That is not how it works. That is all marketing and nothing to do with reality. So just be aware, they all have those cute little doors. Even this one has that cute little door. The only time you're ever gonna use it is if you let the whole compost pile cook down and then you use the little door to get the finished compost out. But it's not like you just add it on top and it naturally finishes to compost at the bottom. Because remember, we're in there mixing it all up the whole time, okay? I'm gonna talk quickly about tools and then I'm gonna come back to all your questions in the chat. So the next handout you have here is about tools. I cannot say enough besides a bin. And by the way, if you don't wanna buy a commercial bin, make your own, that's great, but stick to the same rules we talked about. Um, you can make them out of old pallets, but it's really airy and open and it's gonna dry out fast and critters are gonna get in. You can make them out of chicken wire, but you might wanna line up with something because again, it's gonna evaporate quickly and, and stuff. I've had people make them out of tires. I've had people just dig compost pockets in the ground and put their stuff in the ground. That also will work, but just know you need something. Um, I really think if you're doing it above ground, you gotta have some kind of bin, okay? The other thing you have to have is at least a garden pitchfork. So this is my same one here. These flat four tine kind of ones usually is around 20 bucks or something like that at a hardware store or Target with this D shaped handle. That's the kind you want. And the kind that are only like three feet tall. There's some sometimes that are like four feet tall. You don't want those. You want the shorter 30 inch, yeah, sorry, 30 inches, but it's this shorter kind. You don't want the giant ones and stuff. Yeah, 30, yeah. So 30 inch handle, I think is what they actually are. But the point is you don't want the extra tall ones. That's the key thing. And you don't want the hay fork style with the curved tines that go to a point. Now the other tool people sometimes talk about is compost aerators. It's not necessary, but it's a nice second tool if you want to use one. Now let's talk about how they work. They're basically some kind of handle on top with these little phalanges that fall down. So here is the one that's actually pictured there called the yard butler. They've got these little phalanges in here. Oops, I'm gonna stop sharing. Well, yeah, I'll keep that. And then, um, so you can see that you push it in and it, they fall down into the compost. And then as you pull them up, they pull up compost with them. That is the idea behind them. These work well-ish. They never take the place of a pitchfork. I find you can't really stir up the bin well enough with these, but if you want to use one, don't get any that have the um, L-shaped handle like this. This is the kind to not get. They will make it look like you can do it one-handed with the little marketing stuff on it, but that is again, not true. You need the kind with a T-shaped handle, like what's in your picture, like this guy here and they're a long stick with the phalanges at the bottom. Um, this is the, the yard butler. It's a metal cow powder coated one. It's probably three and a half feet tall. And um, most people like this. Um, I, per I, um, I, it's not my favorite, mostly because I like um, another one that I found long ago and you can't find them anymore, but if you ever see one, Looks a lot like it, but it's plastic and it's shorter. It's like probably 28 inches tall and where the other one is probably 36 inches tall. And so I like this one, but you can't find them anymore. I can't even find them on Amazon from secondary sellers. So I'm just saying if you find something else, but I don't think you have to have this. You really just need the pitchfork. I overwhelmingly use the pitchfork more than I do my little um, aerators. So there's some new ones out that I've been seeing that have like a twist where you're supposed to twist it within the compost. I don't think those move it very far because I think it's going to be dense enough. You're going to have a hard time twisting it within the compost. I find poking in and out with these works better. Now, the whole idea with these is that you end up using your arms more up and down and less reach and pull with your back like you would with a pitchfork. That's the idea behind it. So just be aware of that. That's why some people like it. But honestly, Get yourself, if you have never composted before or you're newish to compost, get yourself the, the, the garden fork and a compost bin. 
I'd order one of those you can get still right now. I checked if your local Home Depot even will deliver it to the store for you here. So you can get one, I believe in Boulder as of a week ago when I checked, everything was still available. But I'm sure by the end of this summer, there's not gonna be many of those uh, soil saver bins left. All right. Okay. Let's, I know we have lots. Let's go back yeah. and talk about this. So I, just so everyone knows, I'm putting them in like a Word document and then kind of sorting them as I know the presentation. So um, uh, Mario asked, how to protect the bin from rodents? The best defense against rodents, Mario, is good maintenance. So it is regularly, once a week, going out, stirring your bin, keeping it damp as a wrung out sponge. That is by far the best thing to do, more than anything else. There are some things that you can buy called rodent plates where you can set the bin on, but I find that they have holes in them that the worms are supposed to know and critters are supposed to know to find the certain holes to get in. And I find that doesn't really work. The best defense really is the good um, good maintenance. Um, we'll also talk about how to add in food waste here in a minute that actually reduces your chances of having critters be attracted to your pile. There's really like a good way and a bad way to do that. So we'll talk about that and that may help you a little bit with that. Um, this is coming from Najwa. Hopefully I said that right. Um, this is a very interesting question. I would love to hear where Najwa is from. Uh, are skinks a good sign in your compost? I've been noticing more of them, especially since spring has come. You said stinks, as in bad smells. Skinks, um, little, I, I looked it up, little lizard type thing, a, rep, a reptile. Oh, um, you know what? I'm guessing probably he's in Washington, D.C. Interesting. Yeah. I would have said Southwest. Um, yeah. You know what? I don't have any of those in Colorado, and that's where most of my compost experience is from. But I would say it's kind of probably like, I think it'd probably be okay, but I wouldn't go out of my way to be attracting them. To me, it's bordering on like mice, you know, it's little critters who are living. And the real issue in all of this is that you don't want these things to be pooping in your pile because their poop, if it's consumed by you can ultimately make you sick. And you're like, well, I'm not gonna eat the compost, but you might use that compost where you grow some lettuce that you just rinse and eat which means it could transfer. That's the biggest reason we don't want wildlife in our compost is because we don't want them to be pooping in our compost. So mm -hmm. I would say, I wouldn't say it's a great thing. I would say, try to just keep really good job of ma maintaining it. It's not probably the end of the world. I don't know how much lizards poop and pee, but um, I'm going to say probably maybe, maybe not as prolifically as mice, but I still would try to keep them out. Yeah. It seems like if you're moving it around it's that same kind of deal it's the same yeah. deal yep if you make it not fun for them to hang out in they will not hang out there <laughs> okay alexis asked this question my husband and i love to make it make compost and do a 45 day high intensive tarping rotating the pile to get above 120 degrees fahrenheit recently recently we learned that there's some science suggesting not to flip the flip the pile similar to no tilling I was wondering if you happen to know more about turning the pile versus not. My biggest, I mean, the honest answer is most of these critters like to be left alone to do what they do, which is why we don't tell you to turn it more than once a week. So, but my instinct is turning it some would be better than not turning it because I think part of what will happen, it'll compress, it'll become anaerobic. And part of what we want is things to break down aerobically with oxygen, because it's when stuff breaks down anaerobically without oxygen that it produces methane gas. It may, because it's a different kind of bacteria, it's thermophilic bacteria that, that, that um, basically help break it down. And that's the one that gives off the stinky smell, mm -hmm. which is why none of us like the smell of a landfill. Mm -hmm. But my point is, is I think you want it to break down aerobically. So to me, I would turn it at least a little bit, which keeps fresh oxygen in there versus letting it go anaerobic. Christine asked, my black bin, the one we have, uh, the soil saver, has shifted from the amount of compost. This is causing my lid to not completely close. Do you have suggestions for that? I find that it's that does happen, but usually if you kind of jiggle it around, it'll end up kind of fitting it. So I would try to, 
maybe pick because the, the the nice thing about the soil savers they come together as four pieces it's almost like a jello mold if you think of it that way you can like lift and shift around on the pile so you could maybe position it in a way that would fit a little better to get your lid on but i find you can there's a little bit of flex with the nuts and bolts too that you can sometimes work with to get it to adjust unless it's bowed way out one side of a panel, it should kind of, if anything, the lid kind of helps tighten it all down and hold it together. That's been my experience. And probably check your nuts and bolts. Yes, and make sure they're not crazy loose. That's a really good point because they do loosen over time. Um, and there was a little bit of conversation in the chat about bear proof bins. And I suggested so, that vermicomposting is gonna be the best option for uh, uh, bear, bear areas. Um, because the so, soil saver, they can knock it over. That is true. I will say, first thing you need to know, there is no such thing out on there at all that is a bear-proof compost bin. Just like there's even not even a bear-proof garbage bin. We all know that. So just know there is no such thing. I find the best defense against bears, first of all, is a well-maintained bin. But I find that if you particularly live in a bear-prone area like the mountains area or the foothills, once bears have identified your bin as food source, I would pull it. I would not use it at all, at least for a season or two to get them like out of the habit. Worm composting is a great option for anybody who's living in, war in bear country. Um, we will talk for like the last five minutes about worm composting. And in your handouts you got from Chandra, there's a whole brochure about how to set up a worm bin. So even if you can't stay for it, that walks you through how to set up a bin. It's one I wrote for the county years ago. So I would highly recommend that. It's something you do indoors. It's not near the volume you get from a backyard pile. Um, there's not everything we're talking about you can put in, but it's a way to do something indoors, which would work in bear country. But no, there is nothing such as bear proof. I still say, and a tumbler bin is not the answer. That is as bad as anything else. So just know that, unfortunately. Letitia asked, um, so you mentioned putting your bin right on top of the dirt. Uh, she said, our ground is clay. Any problem with that? No, no. Any kind of dirt is fine. But my key thing is it shouldn't be on stones, on sidewalk, on patio. It basically needs to be directly in contact with the dirt and have it be level. Like don't put it over a tree root. So it kind of rocks back and forth or anything like that. Have it sit like firmly on the dirt. But no, it doesn't matter what kind of dirt we're talking as long as it's like soil. I mean, mine sits on clay soil at my house too in Colorado, so. <laughs> Okay, and yes, um, somebody's asking if they forgot, forgot their question. I'm keeping a list because I know the, the flow of the of the presentation, so I've got them. Don't she worry. She knows what we're going to talk about next, yeah. so I so promise we'll get your all, questions. That was like bin related. Okay, anything yeah. else about tools? Um, I guess this one could fit in. How to store browns. So um, browns, um, basically, like I said, I use an old, uh, I use a trash bag. That's what I use at my house. Now, if you have another method to store them, store them in anything, but the key thing is to like have them contained so they're not gonna blow around your yard. Some people use an old trash can, um, but I literally, at my house, literally just fill up a black trash bag. I tie it up at the top. It just literally sits on the ground, like laying, sometimes laying, sometimes upright <laughs> next to my compost bin. And it gets rained and snowed on a little, moisture gets in through the top where it maybe isn't tied all the way or it gets holes in it and it gets a little moist. So if you have a hard side in something, that's great if you've got those to use, but really it does not matter as long as you hold on to the equivalent of two to three black trash bags of leaves per pile. So if you got seven garbage bins to use, use seven garbage bins to hold your leaves. But most of us don't have that, which is why I hold on, I use black trash bags. And I use them one season, they get pretty holy. And then I throw them away once I finally empty and use them. But I literally just have it sitting next to my bin. And then once I start breaking into it, like I just have it like rolled back, you know, so it's almost like a bin made of the plastic bag sitting next to there. So when I go out with my kitchen scraps, I literally dump in my pail, you know, like this pail amount full. And then I put that same, grab it with my hands and throw it in to my bin. 
So it doesn't matter how you store it as long as you have them. And I store them right next to the bin. So it's right handy when I'm bringing out my kitchen scraps. Cool, we can move on. I'll keep the rest for after. All righty. Okay, so I am gonna move us on because we have a few more things to talk about. So um, the um, next thing you have in your handouts, I am gonna go back to screen sharing so you guys can see this. So the next thing you have in your handouts is more about how to build a pile from scratch. Now, I'm assuming some of you have never composted before, and that's part of the reason you're here. And also some of you may have an older pile that's been in the corner that you're trying to figure out what to do with. Both of those are salvage, are, are workable within this. So let's talk about building from scratch and then we'll talk about if you got an old pile, what can you do with it? So if you're building from scratch and you're starting fresh with either a new bin or putting it in a new spot or whatever, here's how you actually start. Like I wrote this and it's pretty straightforward, but basically you wanna find a spot and ideally use a bin. I think a bin works best because it really helps keep the moisture in and basically have all your, you have a volume of materials if you can here, ready to go of greens and browns. And then you pick your location. Now people always ask location, should it be in the shade or the sun? And the answer is close to the hose. That's really where your bin should be, close to the hose and close enough that you will use it. That's the first thing about location. Then if I can be choosy, like I said, you want it on level ground. You want it to be directly on top of dirt. Those are all criticals. But then if I can be choosy, I'm picking a spot that is in the shade in the summer. It's not critical for that, but if you're gonna try to compost year round, that would be all winter long, then pick a sunny spot. But it really doesn't matter. Now, when I ask that question, that's because the main compost season in Colorado is like March to November. Most of us don't compost year round. It's too hard in the winter because you still have to go out and turn and water. Um, and we don't do as much in the winter in our yards. And same is true for the critters. They're not going to do as much. So you're not going to see big dramatic um, creation happening. So I just find it's just not worth all the effort. You still have to water it with your hose. And most of us have our hoses put away because, you know, they freeze otherwise. So I don't worry about that. I pick a spot that's more important for the main season, March to November, that my hose is out and what is convenient. So that is best, whether it's sun or shade, most important is the hose. Have it in direct contact with the ground, not on top of wheat cloth, like we talked about. And then how you do it is you actually start, I like to start with greens first. Remember greens are what attract the critters to your pile. So I wanna put that right on top of the dirt, right where they live so that they may come up to my pile. Now, somebody asked about the clay soils. If you're starting um, a bin on dirt you've never had a bin on before, maybe give a stab at the ground a little bit. You don't have to like break it up with a shovel, but like take your pitchfork and just like stab at the ground a little bit, just to, particularly if it's really hard packed dirt, just to help loosen it up to make it a little easier for the critters to come. But if a greens down first, I do three inches and I'm just eyeballing it, you know, about what I think three inches is. Then I put on three inches of green, of browns. Again, lighter, fluffier. This isn't about weight, this is about volume. Then I get out the pitchfork and I mix them all up so that I mix up the greens and browns together. Then I water it with my hose until it feels damp as a wrung out sponge doing the squeeze test. And then I repeat that. So see number four here is just to repeat that until I either fill up the whole bin or it's um, I've run out of materials. So whichever one happens first, do it that way. I just find that really works the best. Now, I usually try to have my bins like full at least or so to half, like I said, to start. And then I add as I go. So as I'm generating stuff from my kitchen, I've got that stash of browns and I keep adding to it. Now that is gonna mean some stuff has been cooking in there for a month or two while I just added some stuff last week. That's okay. That's all part of how our compost piles work. Now, the other thing is, is that you could fill it all the way up if you wanted to, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you want to give yourself a little room to grow, maybe fill it only half full. And then you cover it. I, you have to have a, a lid here in Colorado. You just will lose too much moisture otherwise. And then here's the other key thing at the bottom. And, I, and as I mentioned before, I'll, let me mention a number five here. If not using a bin, use a tarp or an old piece of carpet to cover the pile to reduce evaporation. That is really critical here, especially in Colorado. 
and strap it down um, because it will blow away otherwise. Um, and it, you know, if it's a tarp, try to tuck in all the little pieces as much as you can. Cause you know, like when we get those 80 mile an hour winds, it could easily blow away, but you gotta have some kind of lid. The one other thing that I will say is the internet says you should add soil to your compost pile. Not true. They'll say you should add manure. Not true. They should say you should layer and compost. Not true. Only if you are trying to use a tumbler bin, is it okay to put a little bit in just to help get the population of those critters going in your pile. That's the only time I would suggest ever adding any soil or compost to your pile. Soil actually will weigh down the pile. It'll actually collapse the air pockets we're going for with the little one to two inch pieces. So only put a little handful of dirt or something into a tumbler bin, but just a handful or two. Don't put a lot in because you're really just trying to get that population to transfer. Or the only other time is if you're at like somewhere out east and they've just scraped all the good topsoil off and then you're starting a compost pile like the first year after construction and you know you have terrible soils, you might need to add a little um, soil from a gardener friend or a little compost to help get that population going because there may not, but not be many microorganisms left in that soil because they scraped off all the good stuff for lack of a better word. So that can definitely happen. So next in your handout, you have this great troubleshooting guide. We're not gonna go through this, but I just wanna point out to you, you've got this for later as you're working on this and you're like, oh, I'm not sure this is supposed to happen. You can check. But generally to fix a pile here in Colorado, there's two things you do. You turn and water it just like the maintenance part and you add fresh greens. That generally gets a pile going if it's not doing very much for you because remember greens attract the critters to the pile and generally the pile doesn't, hasn't gotten any air lately and it needs water to be damp as wrung out sponge enough that the critters can live there. So that generally will get your pile going. Now, that being said, if you happen to have an old pile coming back to the how to build it, if you happen to have an old pile sitting in the corner of your yard, that is not waste at this point. We can still do something with it. But remember that stuff is pretty much once a brown, they're always a brown. So something that's been in the back corner of the yard for years, nothing's happening with it. Or maybe you have a bin and you've been throwing some things into it. And part of the reason you're here is because it's not doing great. That pile is probably all brown now. Because remember, we only count it what it was when we put it in, but remember, everything becomes a brown. So if you've got an old pile like that, that can be your browns. You could pull that whole pile apart, use anything you still recognize, that would be a brown, and then layer it in with some fresh greens. But just know the fresher your materials are, the more critters are attracted to your pile. So if you've got some older brown pile and then maybe some leaves from last fall, kind of mix them in together as you use the browns because the fresher, the fresher browns will attract the critters and stuff like that more than the older pile. But you can still use the pile and it'll still finish breaking down. So don't think that is a waste. Okay. Um, all right. I'm going to go back to the last few pages here and then we'll answer more questions. I do wanna to talk to you about dump and run as well too. So this troubleshooting guide, you can look at later. This is about how to use finished compost. Now this is a great new handout that I found that I really like because it has at the top here, what is finished compost? Like how do you know when it's really done? And it's a reminder that it should look like dark crumbly topsoil and not like the original materials. You should not be able to tell what went into that compost? What, what was the food you fed the compost pile? And it should smell earthy, it should smell sweet, it should never smell bad and stuff. And so that's how you know it's finished, when it looks like actual beautiful, rich, lush dirt. And then how do you use it? So you can use it in lots of ways. One of the biggest things I suggest to people is use it mostly as finished compost. Now, how do you get that out? Because what's gonna be happening here is that um, you're gonna have some stuff that maybe you added three months ago that's been cooking down. It's looking pretty good. 
if you could get your hands on it, but it's right next to the stuff you added from your kitchen last week, the avocado pits and, and the avocado peels and the pepper hulls and all the stuff you can still see. So how do you get to the good stuff? Well, what you can do is ultimately, when you're ready to get out some finished compost, hand sort. Anything you still recognize is still not done. So I just pull anything out that I can still tell. Like, oh, this is part of a banana peel. Oh, this is some coffee guns. Oh, this is a little bit of a filter. Oh, some tea bags. Oh, this is some grass clippings. Anything I still recognize, I set aside. I pull out anything that looks crumbly, dark, lush like this. And then I take all that stuff and put it back into the bin. And I add more materials and keep going. I get that bin going. Or this is where people sometimes end up with two bins. They'll have one bin that they're actively adding stuff to. And once that bin gets full over two, three months, then they'll stop adding to that. They're still maintaining it every week. They're just going out and turning and watering it. But then maybe they have a second pile and that's the one they start adding all their fresh materials to. So that this one over here, they're still maintaining while they're adding the fresh materials here and still maintaining this one every week or two by turning and watering. Two, three months will go by. And in two, three months, closer to three months, this bin over here will be full. But the good news is this one's all done. So now you don't have to hand sort anything out. Now you can just pull out all the finished compost all together. So that's one way a lot of people end up with two bins so that they can kind of have more going at the same time, but it is two bins to maintain. So you have to know that. Please know, I was a mess, I was a composter for years without having two bins. I have only had two bins for a while now. In some seasons, I don't ever get to the second bin depending on how busy life is. So don't feel bad just having one. There's nothing wrong with having one bin. But if you get into this, you may decide you want more compost. And I'll be honest, as much as I'm a gardener, I have 11 garden beds. I still want more compost than I could possibly produce. So I'm always buying some. So if you've got the space and you've got the time and you've got the will to do two compost piles, do it. Cause you'll be glad for that homemade compost. It's still so much more rich than anything else than you can buy in a store and stuff, okay? And then, the last bits of your handouts are really just a couple things that I'll point out to you. You can read the details about how to use it. Um, I would just be cautious if you're using partially finished compost. To me, partially finished compost has some stuff that looks done and some stuff you still recognize. I very rarely use it. I mostly either separate them out, but if you wanna use it all together, you really can only use it like as mulch around a well-established tree or bush because that unfinished compost, the stuff you still recognize is gonna keep breaking down wherever you put it. So that's why you can't put it like in your garden beds um, when you are planting or anything like that. It needs to be around stuff that's pretty well established that it's not gonna harm more than it help. And it talks about all this on the sheet, which is one of the reasons I really like this new sheet. So check that one out. And then the last two, uh, last two of the three you got here is just some fun facts about worms. We will talk a little bit more about worm composting in the last five-ish minutes for anybody who wants to stay on. But before we do that, um, I'm, we're going to answer more questions, get to Chandra so she can tell us a little bit more about um, any other opportunities. And this last sheet is just some great websites to look at sometime if you want to deep dive more. Um, but what you got in your um, stuff from Chandra, the handout packet, the two brochures that were PDF and sent to you. One is called The Dirt on Composting. That's a great summary of backyard composting, kind of really high level, but it's still a good one. And then the other one is Worm Composting, How to Build a Worm Bin from Scratch. That's what we'll talk about the last five minutes. So I just wanted you to know what you had in there. All right, Chandra, what else have we got for questions yeah, that I haven't answered? Um, mm -hmm, I think we've, sorry, no, no, sorting. Um, talked about adding new pot, new stuff. And I need to talk about dump and run. So why don't I do oh, that and you yep. figure out questions? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's talk about, because this is another one of the essential on that page two that you have in your handouts. There's five essential things, and this is one of them. You do not want to do what I call dump and run. How that really looks is this. This is your bin. Let's say your pile is like that full across. If you can see my line right there. And you come out with your kitchen scraps and you pull the lid off and you just put your kitchen scraps right there on top of the pile 
and you put the lid back on and you walk away. That's the worst possible thing you can do. What you did is just put all the fresh food waste, the green stuff that came from your kitchen, right on top. That is the stuff that's gonna give off the strongest smells that's gonna track things to your pile. So all you did was just say, everybody come see what I got going on here. There's some fun stuff to check out. <laughs> that's the worst thing you can do. Instead, what you wanna do is actually dig out a little pocket, like literally push the pile aside and put in your food waste from your kitchen. Like I'm literally just dumping everything that came out of here because I already made one to two inches when I stuck it in there in the first place. Then I take the pile itself and push it all back on top of it. Oh, I forgot my browns. So then I put my browns with it from my pile, from my, these are my leaves. I can't draw leaves distinctly different, sorry. And then I put the pile itself back on top of it. So I've got leaves sitting on top of the green food waste I put in and the pile itself putting back on top of it and the lid. So now all those things act as like biofilters for any smells that would come off of any of that food waste I put in. Because it's only when food waste is at the really fresh point that it gives off the strongest odors. So that's why we want to try to get things past that fresh point as quickly as possible. And to do that, we need to put also that food waste we put it then, remember, this is the most active part of the pile, that main kind of circle. And so we kind of put it right where they're at, which means they'll also get after it and work on it right away. So you never want to sit it on top of the pile. Remember, that's that dry part of the pile. You want to push it apart till it's like kind of the moist area where they're living. Put in the food waste then, put the browns on top, and then the pile will make a big difference. So don't dump and run. Okay. I know um, you were doing like seven things, Chandra. So you do whatever you, I can go to chat too and answer and questions. 751. I'm like, I don't know. Okay. Um, Sarah asked about your bins over the winter and you definitely touched on that. You just, you put your, you put your um, hose away. Yeah. yeah. So what I do, I'll be honest at the end of the season, I don't empty my bin. I just leave whatever shape it's in at that point, And I just let it sit in the bin all winter. And then this time of the year is when I will take it and pull it out everything at that point I consider a brown, I will mix it in with fresh greens and build that three inches, three inches, mixing it together, just like we talked about, like beginning from scratch. So I do, I do kind of take it out in the spring, mix it in with other things and put it back in with some of the greens and all that too. But that's really what I do. I only compost kind of that main season, basically when my hose is out, um, which is now, it just got out last week, you know, until like, and I say November, but that's a relative term. Last year, it was October when we had our first snowstorm. So it, it's, it's kind of that March to April, October, November range for us. Um, and you just leave it sit over the winter. You don't go turn out and water it, but you also don't go add anything. You have to not add during that time. What you do instead is you either throw it into a Ziploc bag or a container in your freezer and freeze it, if you have it, this freezer space, or you use your commercial compost and you put it in the commercial compost over the winter, or you have a worm bin, which I know we're going to talk about at the end. And I know we're running late, but I'll just say people who want to stay on, we'll talk about worms for five minutes, but we'll answer all the backyard compost questions first. And I know it's a blitz of information, but I try to make it as, you know, this is what you really need to know. And this is how you be a successful composter. So, all right. Raquel asked, if you are using tumblers, how often do you put in a handful of soil? Only when you're getting it started, as long as the critters have not died, if it seems to be going, I put in a couple handfuls at the beginning, but that's the only time you do it. Don't add it on a regular basis, because again, remember that soil is going to weigh down and collapse the air in there already. So you don't want to add extra soil. You don't need to. You're only doing it to try to get the critter population essentially to start reproducing inside your tumbler bin. That's what you're trying to make happen. Brenda asked, why can't you put the kitchen scraps that aren't done into the garden? Because what will happen, it depends on where you put them. But the real issue is, is that they're going to keep breaking down wherever they are. And so if you put them in your garden where you have new plants, 
it will actually rob those plants of nutrients instead of helping it. So I would say you could put them in now if it's a garden bed, you're not gonna plant till like end of May, that would totally work because it will break down between now and May. But you can't, and I'm saying end of May, thinking you're planting warm weather crops like zucchinis and squashes and, and tomatoes. But you can't do that like once you have the garden in and then July comes as those plants are growing and they're this tall and you're trying to get them to grow, you can't be digging it in then because it'll actually rob them of nutrients instead of helping. They will keep breaking down wherever you put them. Um, have you heard about using temperature measurements to tell if the compost is finished or not? So the answer is there are such things as called compost thermometers. They are $20, $25. It is a glorified meat thermometer. You do not need one of those. In, in Colorado, doing most backyard piles, you are gonna be at 80 at the most when you add fresh greens. That's the real temperature of the pile is actually the body heat given off by all the critters who are doing the work. That's why a hotter pile is associated with more activity because there are more critters in there doing the work. But because it's so dry in Colorado, our backyard piles never get enough critters concentrated enough to raise the temperature of our piles. So 80 at the high end, most of the time 60 to 75. You can buy a $25 thermometer to tell you that, but that's not gonna change anything. It's still gonna compost. And to, just to give you an idea, a fully full bin, turning it once a week. It's got a 50-50 mix of greens and browns, turning and keeping it damp as a wrung out sponge. The fastest you're gonna get a full bin of finished compost is three months, two to three months, but it's closer to three months, like 60 to 90 days, but 75 to 90 days is what we're really talking. That's the fastest anybody's gonna get. Most of us get two, three batches a season if we're lucky. So just realize like you can't speed this up in Colorado, it's just too dry. We have so much evaporation happening all the time. It's really tough to do it if you're doing the regular way of a, of, and that is still the way I recommend. That's what I do. I mean, a regular old bin. I'm not talking the turning thing that one person mentioned or anything like that. Okay, all right. Worms. So for anybody who wants to stay on, we're gonna talk worms. I'm gonna open up my worm bin and show this to you. So again, if you can't stay, this is that, um, um, that orangey brochure that was PDF'd and sent to you to so you can look at later. And if you, that's why I'm going to blitz through this because you have all that info to refer to later. But let me get my worm bin actually here. Okay. And I'm going to plug, uh, I'm dropping, I'm going to plug in my uh, webcam as well. What is it here? Okay. So. By the way, I'll just show this to everybody so if you can see. So this is my worm bin. So it's just a regular 10 gallon um, um, rubber made from um, like a hardware store or something like that. And bear with me a second. I should recognize it. We're working on that. I'll talk to you until it does. Um, so basically, how you do a worm bin is something you do, has a lot of the same rules we we talked about, except the difference is you do it indoors. Okay, again. So the big thing is, is that you do this indoors. So you can do this year round. You can do this in winter. It's actually one of the ways to compost in the winter, okay? Now, the great thing is it's really good for apartments, condos, small spaces, maybe you don't have a backyard. Maybe you're hearing what backyard composting takes and are thinking, my back can't take that. I think I got to do something else. Or maybe you live by yourself. You can do worm bins outdoors, but really only in a special situation. Because of the year round weather we have in Colorado, you could keep them outside in the, in the summer, but you can't keep them outside in the winter. Um, worms like to live where you and I live, 55 to 75 degrees. Think room temperature. So their skin member is covered with water, which is why they can't be outside when it's freezing temperatures. So even this time of the year, while it's warm during the day, it can be cool at night. So that's why we really just recommend keeping them inside. Now my worm bin literally lives in my little family room right by the kitchen, right in front of the fireplace, mostly because I don't use the fireplace and it's just a good way for me to see it. 
but really it's all about keeping it close to you. Just like the compost bin being convenient to the hose, keep your worm bin close to you. Now, how this works is you get an opaque 10 gallon bin, and then you take your regular household drill and just drill a few holes in it. So this is the lid. You do need to have something with a nice tight fitting lid. And then you put a few holes on the sides, just like two on the ends and three. See, they're not a lot of holes, okay? Then you fill it. My webcam is not cooperating, so I'm just gonna show you all. Um, you fill it with shredded newspaper. It is just one to two inch size. Now the difference is, is that I am filling it with essentially, this is the browns and I'm filling it with the browns first, not with putting it in as I go, but I actually fill that first and I make them damp as a wrung out sponge, which really means I take shredded newspaper print and then I fill the whole bin full of it. And then I spray it really good with a spray bottle until it is damp as a wrung out sponge. The other brown you could use, sometimes people use dried leaves, but I find that they make more of a mess. Now, if you're thinking, I don't get a newspaper anymore, what do I do about that? Go to the free newsstands and pick up one of those. Go to the gas station and buy a, a paper and it will last you for a month or two to use for your worm bin or talk to your neighbor who still gets the newspaper and get theirs. That's what I do in my case. So you're literally just using the, the, the newsprint just like this. I'm not, this is just torn by hand. There's nothing special about this. And I fill it completely full, damp as a, and, and I make it damp as a wrong sponge. Now the hard part with worms is that you have to separate the worms from their beddings. Now where you get worms, I will give you my local source, which is his name is John Anderson. His name is on the back of that worm brochure. He lives up in Fort Collins and he does green building consulting and grows red wiggler worms. Now the kind of worms these are are red wiggler worms. These are the same worms that are in a backyard pile. But in a worm bin like this, there might be as many as a thousand in here. And so this is not something you can walk into a bait shop and buy. These are like you something you have to specially get from a guy who does red wiggler worms. You can buy them online. I'll be honest, I've bought some of the ones from Amazon to try. I don't think they're as hardy as the ones I've gotten from John. I find that the population lasts for a year or two and then it seems to not always thrive. Where John's always thrive. So, and how John grows his, he does grow his outside, but they are in these massive beds that are like the length of a house. Um, there's so much mass that they actually keep each other warm. And then the other thing he does is he takes old fridges and freezers and lays them on their sides and turns those into insulated worm beds. Oh, too bad I can't show you. They look so great. I'm for my laptop. I'm sorry, my webcam is not cooperating, but let's see. Um, hang on, are you guys still there? Oh, there we go. Okay, can you see them? There's some of my worms. They're all starting to disappear because I uncover them. Worms do not like to live. I hope there's a whole mush of them. Hopefully you can see my little guys. Yes. So they do not like to live out here because it is dry and light and they like to live in a dark, moist environment. So as a result, if you expose them to the air like I just did, they will then um, burrow down away from you. They don't like to be out here. So that's why the good news is, even if there's a thousand of these guys in there, they will never, ever, ever leave this bin. Unless life is like, even if it's really bad in there, they will climb onto the lid on the underside and things like that, but they will never leave the bin. So what happens is that they will, um, you know, get away from something they don't like. They don't like, onions, they don't like garlic, they don't like things with a lot of um, um, flavor. You know, they like veggies, fruits, coffee grounds, eggshells, tea bags, but they don't like pungent, pungent things. They don't, so that's what they like to stay away from. Now, when I got the worms from John, they do come in a bag. 
And you can't take the whole bag and just dump it into the bin. You do have to actually sort out the worms. And so by doing that, you have to actually use the fact that they don't like it where it's light and bright, that they only like it where it is dark and moist. So as a result, what I find that they do is that they, wait a second, there we go, that they, um, if you, they actually will burrow down into the pile you get from John. And by the, by the way, I've taken this pile and laid it all out on the tarp so that I've tried to thin it as much as possible so that there's only a couple inches over the whole tarp so that I've really exposed the worms and they'll stay away from the light. They'll actually burrow down into that little inch or so trying to get away from the light. And that's because they can't breathe where it's dry like this, because remember their skin is covered with water. And so they will actually die if they're out in too much air for too long. So that's, I use that to my advantage. I sort out some of the bedding that they came in from John. So I have mostly just the worms left. And then I put them in that bin on top of that damp newspaper. That was the brown. And then I put in some greens for them. I give them food waste only. I don't give them any of the yard waste, no grass trimmings or anything like that. And it's better to lightly feed worms than overfeed. They, um, as they get more food, they will start creating more and more worms and reproducing more. And eventually your bin will get full of lots of worms. My bin is really full right now. Um, even though the bin is about this tall, you don't wanna let it get more than about half full of castings because my bin now probably weighs 40 to 50 pounds. So it gets really dense in the um, worm bin, but it's the most nutrient dense of any kind of compost. Most compost tea that you ever buy commercially is made with worm compost, worm castings, worm poop is all the same words for worm compost. And um, it's the most nutrient dense. It is more than what comes out of your backyard pile. The problem is it's not the volume producer your backyard pile is. It can't take everything your backyard pile can't. And they're gonna make in the bin maybe this much compost in probably three to four months. So it's not going to be very full quickly. They'll eat that newspaper that I initially filled the bin with. I'll keep replacing that occasionally as I see it getting thin. And I also pull back that newspaper and put the food waste underneath it and then put the newspaper back on top because that keeps fruit flies away. My bin is in my house and I have not had any fruit fly issues at all. I have more fruit fly issues from tomatoes from my own garden um, when they come into the house. So, um, so I'm gonna to go to the questions now. Can you transfer worms from the indoor bin to the outdoor bin? You can, you don't need to. Um, you never need to buy worms to add to an outdoor bin, but it doesn't hurt. If you have an excess amount of them, you definitely can um, add more. Often what people do is they'll have one worm bin going and it's going so well, they'll end up maybe buying worms, um, sorry, taking some of their worms and sharing them with somebody else so that they can start a worm bin because the worms can only um, handle about, a bin can only handle about a thousand worms. And so what's gonna happen is even if they start, um, even if you give them more food, they won't be able to reproduce more than that. And you should not ever get a bigger bin than this. You don't want a deeper bin because remember worms are only used to living in the top two, three inches of the soil. So that does not help you. You should really have multiple 10 gallon bins versus having one extra large bin. All right, Chandra, any yeah. other um, questions? How answer? do you save the worms from ants? How do I save the worms and the ants? I don't worry about the worms and the ants. I shouldn't, I have usually little white bugs in my worm bin, but I usually don't have ants. So there's nothing, I didn't know worms and ants were in conflict, let's put it that way. So I don't worry about it and I do nothing to save them. That's the only thing that really shows up in my bin is these little white, tiny little bugs initially as some of the food waste is breaking down. But that's, other than that, I don't do anything else. And I don't worry about any of the worms outside. They do their own thing. It's the same 
um, species, but they do their own thing outside if they're interacting with the ants out there. Um, Brenda asks, can you use shredded cardboard? You could, but I would prefer newspaper. Cardboard is just thicker and it's not going to soak up as much water. You want something that's really gonna get really damp really quickly because um, remember we're adding greens, which is a lot of moisture content. So I often, when I'm adding more newspaper, put it in dry initially and I don't make it damp after that first time and see how much of the excess water it soaks up. And then if I need to, after a few days, I add a little water to it to spray it down if it's not quite gotten damp enough. But I would not use cardboard, sorry. That's it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, Good thank job, you. Melanie. Yay.